No one should be out. Last work, day's work up. Ta-da! Oh, do we got sound for those who aren't here? We are. Okay. Talked about mutations, change chromosomes, uh, entire chromosome mutations, point mutations, junk DNA, uh, changes that don't make a difference. Uh, cause that's often known as genetic drift. Um, I didn't put that up there, but if you go on on that, and that populations will change, but there's there's no advantage or disadvantage. It just drifts. Uh, as it does, we have positive mutations. I think we then did negative mutations, which are the vast majority. Uh, and now, are we on the, what we asked? We were on hemophilia. And then we're going to go to the different types of mutations from there. Let's see who's late. Did I do the twin one last day? I think so. Actually, I don't know. No, it was in science and Oh, okay. So they may not. Oh, but they probably would because some of them are. Hello, why are you so late? Oh, that's a long way. I feel like same isn't really. Okay. Hemophilia, color blindness, and albinoism are all examples of common mutations. Where am I? Uh, an analogy of a gene was a sentence, and its function is its meaning. Um, its protein, I'm going to say, is the old dog sit. If we had a positive mutation, we might get something like change one letter of this to improve the sentence. H. Where? You can just change it. Dave, too early. Too early for us. Change one letter, improve the sentence. Yes, sit here. Go out and grab one. They should be up here somewhere. Or check the back. That's a worksheet. Yeah, I think it was like that. There you go. That's but now you have to say, prove the sentence. That? Yeah, the old dog sit. What did it ask the old the old dog sits? Yeah. Oh, that works. Um, one single mutation, and uh, it's actually slightly improved. Any other variation that would slightly improve that sentence from the original? Because you know the meaning of the old dog sit, but it's not correct. The old dog? Oh, you, you, that's just inflection. <laughs> the old dog sit. No, she's making dog plural. The old dogs sit. Oh, that would work too. We're, we're coming up with so many versions that I didn't even think of that are fixing the problem. The old dogs. It. Yeah, I'm just going to go with those two then. Um, I thought the old dog sat uh, to fix it to make it singular. Everybody else making the uh, dog part uh, plural in some way, sits or dogs. Negative mutation. How can we change that to be bad? Not evil bad, but like no longer makes sense. But just one point mutation. <laughs> Nosing. <laughs> yeah. Can you just get E to like a E or something or like a round of letters? Uh, yeah. Like the old Eog sit.
Now it's clearly a typo. Nobody's going to understand necessarily what that means. Neutral mut mutation. It's not better, but it's also not worse. It's just different. Oh, different? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one letter. One letter? Yeah. Oh. Haven't heard from the you yet. The odd. Ooh, nice one. The odd dog sit. Sentence has an identical function, it's just different. Uh, maybe it'll, uh, um, people read that, well, probably the story will function much as it did before. Substitution. So now we're going to use that type of uh, um, analogy to talk about different types of mutations. Uh, substitution come in the varieties of silence. missense and nonsense. These are actually technical terms. Um, if you have a substitution mutation, you have a change to a single base in the codon. Now, a reminder, the codon is actually that part. But if we change the DNA, we change, uh, um, uh, and the mRNA, uh, we'll change it all the way through. Um, if we have uh, um, a uh, protein, say AAG is coding for lysine. AAA also codes for lysine. So you won't get uh, um, a type there. Which one of those do you think it is? Silent, missense, or nonsense? Nonsense. If it goes from lysine to lysine. Well, so they, this is the original. And these are representing, uh, like, the mutations. If you change AAG to AAA, what kind of mutation is that? If it's lysine in both cases? Silent. Silent. It's a silent mutation. Of the other two, uh, um, we have nonsense and we have conservative, non-conservative. You don't need to worry too much about that. Conservative, non-conservative has to do with it going into the um, same type. So if you change AAG to UAG, you get a stop codon, and that just cuts off the protein. Um, if you made it something uh, that will destroy whatever it is. Missense, you change a single mutation, AGG or ACG, uh, and you get something completely different. Um, one of this, uh, if you go on in biology, the reason this is called conservative is because you notice this protein, uh, this amino acid, has NH2 there. This one still has NH2. So although it's a um, missense uh, um, mutation, it might actually still work because it looks kind of the same. But if it changes it to a completely different amino acid, like threonine, uh, odds are it won't work at all. It's called non-conservatives. It's a, a more radical type kind of change. Okay, two. Frame shift. Today we are going to blast through a fair amount of notes. Um, then on Wednesday, we're going to have a lab in the classroom, uh, push all the desks aside and do something on the latter section. Um, and then Friday is going to be your quiz just for the week. Frame shift mutation is a deletion. Or addition of a codon that shifts the reading frame. These can be particularly damaging. 
Um, I want to use, because all of this is more easily explained if I took my old example, the old dog sit. There's our protein. And we're going to have a frame shift mutation in which we had a mutation right here. Now, it is a frame shift. So that isn't substituted, it's deleted. So it becomes the Ugs it. Everything has been shifted. Everything has been shifted over one to make up for the deletion because codons are still read in groups of three. Um, my original sentence tried to give that framing by giving groups of three. So you can see if we have something here, and threonine, arginine, threonine, alanine, tyrosine, and we go in and we add one to it, uh, we get a different frame. C, G, A, and now we have G, G, A, and now C, U, G, and it just keeps going. And you can have one where you take one out and it shifts it. You can put one in and it shifts it. But if you completely uh, um, shift it, you're going to get a completely different set, uh, sequence of amino acids. These are almost always um, negative uh, um, mutations. If you're going to get a positive mutation, it's usually going to be a substitution. You've made a slight change. Sometimes there are examples of positive mutations that do that, but they're incredibly rare. Um, they have their own fat cat example. Yeah, Timmy. Why does the why does the e to demonstrate a frame shift mutation. So it was deleted because that just happened. It's to represent a mutation. You wouldn't want that to happen on purpose. But you can imagine if you were doing a, a typesetting on an old fashioned typesetter, and you forgot to put in a letter, all your words wouldn't make sense after that. Yeah. Can it be any of the letters? Like yeah, you could have a frame shift mutation just at the very end where you delete that. How do you know which one? And then, and then that will go C, C, and then A. You don't know which one. It's mutation. It happens randomly. So it's not like you can predict it. Yeah. Um, but when it, it's just like a frame shift, wouldn't it be like, like, wouldn't the T be alone? Like, why didn't you just take out the E? Wouldn't, oh. Like, wouldn't it be hair? Yeah, uh, because this A, this is an analogy. So if, if you took that out, like, on a type, on a word processor, then it would just say, <laughs> old man sit, the old dog sit, right? But this is an analogy for this, in which whoa, structure of DNA, do you see these grouped in groups of three on DNA? No, in terms of the structure, like when you built it, could you naturally see three codons at a time? Is there spacing? No, there's no space. It just reads at three groups at a time. So these are all next to each other. So if um, uh, that's a frame minus one uh, frame shift, uh, they took out in for ACG. Uh, they took out one of them here. So they frame shifted it there. If you deleted, let's say that one, then you get GAG. So let's say we frame shifted it that way. Then it just it just starts reading them in groups of three. It's just automatic. Because there's no spacing in the genome. So in a sentence, the analogy doesn't quite work because you see the spacing. But you can imagine that if we had the, the, it was set, like the spacing was set, as soon as you move one over, everything just moves over to take it up. That's how it works. Loop three is chromosomal. It is. It is. Chromosomal mutations. Uh, mutations to whole part of the chromosome. Uh, trisomy 21, uh, which used to be known as Down syndrome, is a translocation error. Um, they have an extra copy of chromosome 21. So 
not only is removing a copy bad um, in that it will it will have an effect um, having extra copies produce too much and it removes some of the regulation that's going on and so things don't develop in the way that they're supposed to develop uh, the earlier syndrome uh, I sold you Wolf uh, I don't really know how to pronounce that partial deletion of chromosome 4 lactose tolerance a positive mutation uh, from chromosomal so I would normally say chromosomal mutations are usually fairly serious because you're doing damage to a large amount but this is how we get duplications of genes so there are examples of potentially beneficial uh, um, consequences if a whole gene duplicates and you have more copies then you can regulate more copies so deletion you just take away part of it and it's now different uh, um, translocation uh, you are going to move different parts around um, the law of independent assortment where genes can be moved around independently of each other aren't quite true if they're on the same chromosome uh, but if little fingers of the chromosome come really next to each other they can actually switch places sometimes and you get chromosomes where genes are also always associated with other genes um, let's say you had the genes for I don't know. On the same chromosome, you had the gene for um, blue eyes. You also had the gene for really pointy fingernails. And those traits were all the same together. Um, those, those particular genes wouldn't really independently assort. But all of a sudden, you have a switching down there. And now, all of a sudden, that they're on different locations, they can independently assort. They're no longer joined at the hip. Uh, inversion, um, chromosome legs can flip. So what was pointing out can now point in. This can be particularly bad. Uh, you have an area on the end of your chromosome called, uh, um, those are called the teleomers. Um, and sometimes the genes that are put there are genes that you don't necessarily need as badly. Um, because as you get older, uh, there's an enzyme that carves those ends off. It's like a, um, a ticking biological clock. And as they get carved off and it starts working into your genes, that's when you start experiencing the symptoms of extreme old age. Um, it's a way of apparently making sure you don't live too long. So you have a biological clock in there that's actually actively take, trying to take you down. Were there some animals, one that have like something that make those things like regenerate? Yep. So like turtles have, there's some species of turtles that live for 100 years. They have something that repairs the tea lemurs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's active research into that. Um, and I saw a podcast with a, a scientist who works with that, and they were like, if you could get the gene for the telomeres repair system, would you like CRISPR's coming? Do you want to put it in yourself and you'd live for longer? You have wouldn't have symptoms of because you know you can't just get older. You also wouldn't have the symptoms as badly as getting older. You'd have lots of other symptoms like cardiovascular disease. A lot of it is based on environment, um, heart not heart like heart disease, and so there's a whole host of symptoms you'd still get. But some of the extreme like dementia and other ones uh, would help. And he was like, absolutely not. I've never taken it in a million years. Because you know what else repairs the telomeres? Cancer. And everything we've shown, also, if you give yourself that, you'd, you're just giving yourself perhaps super cancer. So you'd have to do it just right, and we don't quite know enough yet. But yeah, it does exist. And there's animals that have a natural version. Yeah. Um, and duplication. So in some part, whoops, I meant to have an eraser there. In some part, if you have a, like a gene, you could just get two copies of that gene. You can get just a little bit bigger, um, as that happened to the lactose uh, tolerance. Mm. Mutagenic factors. Mutagen, anything that causes a mutation. They come in chemical forms. The University of Victoria, they used to um, have what we called carbon tet sitting on the counter in spray bottles like we have water. Um, carbon tet is carbon tetrachloride, CCL4, and it's a great solvent. It is as good as water is for nonpolar things. So where we use water to dissolve salt and sugar and lots of uh, dirt things, and you can use soap. Carbon tetrachloride will dissolve plastic. 
um, and any type of plastic. It's really good at the non-fuller stuff. The stuff water doesn't dissolve, Carbon Tech does. So you have in spray bottles when you're working with chemicals just to dissolve that stuff in and get it out as you need it. And then they took it away from us and they wouldn't let us have us. Us first years weren't allowed to have it anymore because we kept having spray bottle fights with the Carbon Tet and it's a class one carcinogen, which means it is in the class of compounds that are the most cancer causing known to humankind. And you're not supposed to spray, spray it in your lab partner's face just because he's annoying you. Um, and they wouldn't let us play with it anymore. Amazing stuff. If you sprayed it, sprayed it on someone, it would dissolve their pants away if they weren't made out of like cotton or some other organic material. And if they had any amount of polyester, their pants would just dissolve. It was hilarious. Physical. Or biological. Physical is the one everybody's scared of. Um, that's ionizing radiation. And I didn't erase that term. I should have. Do you have that on your sheet? Yeah. Yeah. I must have text recognized it last year and didn't notice. X-rays, gamma rays, UV rays, non-ionizing radiation um, are things like microwaves, And so how many of you have been told by your parents or someone that micro don't put your face up to microwave or you'll get cancer? Yeah, you can't cause cancer. Uh, your cell phone can't give you cancer. It's the wrong type of wave. It's oh, non-ionizing yeah. radiation. You, are, you can sleep in a thousand cell phones. You might boil yourself if you manage to get the heat out of the, uh, that many, but you're not going to cause yourself cancer. <laughs> Tell your shoes. Who? My mom. Uh, well, bring along your notes and show the um, spectrum uh, and explain it. Because if you just say it, they'll be like, and I believe it. Oh, at that point, too, an important caveat from class when you mention this, what does Mr. Neufeld say about anything your parents tell you? Will they always be good? Your parents are always right. I will throw anything under the bus, not to contradict a parent. So if your parent says, that flashlights cause cancer, then I will agree with that. So you have to use the knowledge to try and do it. Here's the entire spectrum, uh, just so you can do that. Uh, we have it. So when we talk about uh, frequency, we, we're talking about everything's moving at the speed of light. How fast when it's moving, how many wavelengths pass in a second? That's the frequency. The more uh, wavelengths you have that are passing, um, the higher the frequency, it's also um, the shorter the wavelength. Now, if you have a really, really short wavelength, then you have a wavelength that can actually hit the bonds between the atoms, vibrate those bonds, and break them apart. Gamma rays, then, are really, really short wavelengths. They can completely irradiate you, and because they're so small, they can actually penetrate deep into your body, in some cases, go right through you. Um, Weirdly, that means they're not quite as dangerous as some other types of uh, radiation because the more radiation your body manages to stop and absorb, the more bonds will be broken. Gamma radiation is going right through you. You just have to get out of the room and then you're fine. If you eat something in which it absorbs all of the radiation, now you're absorbing all of the radiation you can't get out of the room. Gamma rays uh, um, break bonds. X-rays break bonds. But right here is the limit for ionizing radiation. They actually put this, the line's there, but then they colored it wrong. So if you could bring that coloring over. Because the last point in which we can break bonds is the ultraviolet. The ultraviolet bees can see that. You could see them see it too if you didn't have lenses in your eyes. People have had their lenses removed um, because of disease or other problems. So you get the lens removed from your eye. You can't see. Everything's incredibly blurry. But you can still see colors and very, very, like an out-of-focus camera. You can still kind of see things. And people will then report that they see more colors. Like they'll look at a flower. It's incredibly blurry. And they see a pattern where everybody else just sees white. Ult uh, um, there is ultraviolet colors in our spectrum that bees, for example, can see, and flowers will color themselves with it because it will attract the bees. Um, 
We can't see those because our, our lenses actually block ultraviolet. Ultraviolet will introduce damage into the DNA. It is easily absorbed in that it cannot penetrate very far into your skin. So that's why it causes skin cancer. It doesn't cause like bone cancer because it can't get to your bones unless you like exposed it to sunlight. But if you're going into a tanning bed, that's the kind of cancer you're giving yourself. You're absorbing all that radiation into your skin. Ben, I think your hand is up. Oh yeah, uh, I just want to know like which one, like um, which radiation you're aiming for. Oh, that physical, not even in the spectrum. So physical uh, um, is like giving off neutrons. Um, it might also be gamma, um, because if you are a radioactive element, they will give off alpha particles, beta particles, and um, gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is a form of light. Uh, whereas alpha and beta are actual physical stuff. So, uh, x-rays work because they only absorb um, some of them. They're stopped by your bones. And if you have a photographic plate, that ionizing radiation will hit that photographic plate and uh, develop the photo. But you are giving yourself a little bit of cancer. When they first uh, um, knew uh, had x-rays, they used it for everything. They didn't know about the cancer. You could walk into a shoe shop and you'd have a live x-ray machine that you'd stick your feet in um, and you would see on a monitor above it your, your skeletal feet inside your shoe to see if it fit properly. Um, and then people started getting foot cancer and they stopped doing that. Beyond this, as we go through the rest, Visible light, like other than here at the ultraviolet, so we have UV light, which gives you skin cancer, but like here we have like yellow. This is really short wavelengths. Now we're getting into longer. Radio waves have wavelengths like super long, like meters. Microwaves have uh, wavelengths that are literally centimeters large. The reason that the... Um, Protective coating on your microwave, it's a grid. If you've ever looked at it closely, it's just a bunch of black lines. The reason it can't get through that is because the wavelengths are literally too big to go through the hole. They're very large. Um, and so when they try and go through, they just get blocked by the grid. You cannot get cancer from a microwave. If you could, all of the light you looked at would give you cancer. It would be, that's even smaller of a wavelength. The most thing a microwave can do is heat it up. It can vibrate bonds. Just like heat radiation from lights can vibrate bonds and you can get heat from a fire. But microwaves aren't going to, uh, beyond heating up, it's not going to give you cancer. It could hard boil you. Uh, if you stared at a microwave and it didn't have a protective coating, your eyes are not going to get cancer. You could hard boil your eyes because the vitreous fluid inside your eyes is very similar to white, uh, um, uh, the white part of yolk. That could hard boil. But that's about it. No cancer. I don't know if that would be useful to you in that moment, um, but no. So you can't get it from power lines. You can't get it from radio. You can't get it from Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is in the microwave range. Um, you can't get it from microwaves themselves. So we start being able to excite more electrons in visible light. Um, and then we get into damaged DNA, UV, and onward. So the reason you can't get it uh, from a cell phone is because cell phones use microwaves. So yes, you can sleep with your phone and not have any risk of uh, microwave radiation. The only danger there is that you have a risk of what? What's your biggest risk with a, with a cell phone? Mm -hmm. yeah. Burning yourself. Pardon? Burning yourself. Burning yourself. They get really hot uh, and sometimes the batteries explode. Mm -hmm. Has any of you seen the videos in which a battery explodes in someone's uh, either their vape or their cell phone? Vapes have a really high uh, capacity, um, so they're a little bit more likely to occur with those. But they also have those cell phones, and they get to 1,000 degrees, like quickly, like 800 degrees Celsius in your pocket um, as it's going off. So it's also, if you feel it starting to really warm up, put it aside, just in case the battery's starting to go. It's rare, but it could happen. Chemical mutations. You may be wondering why I have a um, picture of KISS on the side, and that's because heavy metal 
but also when I typed in heavy metal mutations, that was like in the first five results on Google Images. So I just thought that was cool. Uh, benzene acrylamide is an incredible one. Um, acrylamide I used in university. We had to have a class two lab. Class one is when you work with like Ebola. Um, but we had a class two in which we would have to completely make sure um, that we were clean. We would get into an entire suit. Uh, we would put on gloves. Um, and then we'd go in and use the acrylamide to induce mutations into bacteria. Um, and once those mutations were introduced, um, we would take the bacteria back out again once we're sure all the acrylamide is gone. Acrylamide, it turns out, they found out in the 90s and early 2000s is a natural product of the late stages of burning protein and fat. So the black bits on a piece of steak or meat are high in acrylamide. And so one of the reasons we think that a diet uh, um, high in um, uh, things like burgers and stuff have been known to increase your risk of cancer is actually the acrylamide. So when you're cooking, you want to cook it, you can brown it, don't eat the black bits, um, or cook in a way that reduces the amount of the black bits because that is a very dangerous uh, um, cancer-causing chemical. Um, it's also present in smoke. Especially tobacco so smoke. Um, one of the reasons people initially started to switch to vapes, vapes was originally a health, uh, um, a health product. The companies who made them were the same product uh, companies that made patches. Tobacco companies and startups didn't make vapes. Uh, they were solely to reduce uh, the amount that, uh, that you would smoke in a traditional cigarette. And the thought was, well, it'll be healthier. It turns out nicotine accelerates cancer growth if you have cancer. So while the smoke induces, uh, is more likely to induce cancer, um, if you get cancer for any reason, nicotine will make it rapidly grow. Um, it's an accelerant for that. So it, I don't think it directly causes the cancer itself. But cancer rates since switching to vaping have gone down, but not nearly as much as we thought. Um, and it turns out they're also quite bad for your health, it turns out. We're getting more information on that as more people are smoking it, though. Oops. Anything, lots of things chlorinated. Uh, heavy metals, lead is cancerous. Uh, um, uh, mercury is cancerous. Uh, cadmium is particularly cancerous. So there's a variety of uh, environmental factors that you have to, um, we would want to worry about. And anything you can eat like that that causes cancer is also known as a carcinogen. Now, this is also a bit of uh, chemphobia. I found the graphic and put it on there, so it's not like I didn't do that. There's a lot of things in a cigarette. There's a lot of things in a lot of things. The amount really, really matters. The main thing that you would be worried about in here, because they're talking about butane from the lighter fluid. Yeah, if you're lighting it with a lighter, that's not really great. Uh, they call methane sewer gas. It's just natural gas. Um, there is a little bit of alcohol in there, but nicotine accelerates cancer growth. Um, and because you smoke it, uh, the little bit of heavy metals that are in there make a bigger difference. And I like how they have acetic acid. They label it vinegar below, but it's like, who, who cares? And ammonia. Yeah. What are you saying? That isn't arsenic literally like rat poison? Sorry, what? Arsenic. Arsenic, arsenic yeah. Rat poison. Yep. Mm. It's also in well water. Get your wells tested because um, sometimes it'll just pop in into wells. Uh, it's a chemical in the ground. Um, 
the one of the reasons why all this stuff ends up in um, tobaccos is for much the same reason. Grade nine. Do you do um, ecosystems and food chains? Have you done food chains? Yeah. What happens to a predator in terms of toxicity? Well, it um, like when there's like a lot of um, chemicals in like let's say fish, and then like when the fish get eaten by another um, predator, they have all the chemicals now. Right. And then when they get eaten by a bigger chemical, I mean predator, then they have all the chemicals. Yeah. So concentrate. Yes. Right. Um, when you have to, when you eat a salad, you're you're eating the raw leaves. You eat whatever's in there, and there's a ton of chemicals in our in the environment. You might be taking in small trace amounts of lead and everything else. When you dry that and compress it, now you have far more leaves that you would otherwise have. So the natural amount of arsenic that might be in the system will just increase. Um, and when you breathe it in, um, heavy metals in the smoke are more likely to de deposit than being breathed back out, like the ash does. Now, they like to list the amount and all the different kinds. As a chemist, I'm like, most of that's chemphobia. The nicotine alone is a reason to avoid it. It doesn't matter if you're vaping or smoking. That itself is bad. Uh, the smoke itself, I'm mostly worried about the acrylamide. That's made in high amounts. And that's going to give you cancer. Everything else there is just a bonus. It's there for fun. Uh, what benzene does is, this is a model of it. It gets into, and acrylamide does something like this too, it is a similar structure. It uh, gets in between the uh, base pairings, between like say A and T, and disrupts it so that when you read it, it doesn't read it correctly and it'll pop in different things and you get a mutation. To get cancer, you need several mutations. And over the course of your life, you just accumulate them. The more you accumulate, it's like buying lottery tickets. The more you buy, the more you can win. Except the prize is cancer. Bacteria and viruses. This hits different um, after COVID. We're already no noticing that cancer rates are on the rise. Um, if you were infected, um, the amount of people who are infected by COVID, uh, any virus, any flu can actually introduce it. But because we had a pandemic where a lot of people were infected at the same time, we're noticing that spike. Um, Viruses actually can insert themselves into your DNA. If anything goes wrong in that process, they introduce a mutation. Uh, bacteria could do it as well. Um, hepatitis B and C. Cause liver cancer. And how do viruses do it? Virus invades the cell. Substitutes its own DNA into the host DNA. Now you have a mutation because you have DNA there that you um, didn't have before. And now you're making viral proteins. Though the reason it does that is you're making the proteins the virus needs for its coat to go and infect other people. It will grab its coat, head out into the bloodstream, and now you sneeze and lick and mucus everybody around you. Maybe you vomit a few times, you bleed on some people. They get the virus now as well. You poop it out, goes into the water, and uh, um, they get sick. Uh, one of the... Um, in London, have you heard the cholera study of London? Cholera, um, a disease. Um, okay, London. The River Thames. Companies would pump water from here into homes. So there's some homes, they're getting some water. The Thames is flowing this way. Another company also wants to make money putting water into the Thames. Right here, 
from all of the homes is a great big sewer outfall. So all the urine and the feces is being dumped raw into the Thames. What's that going to do to these people? Which homes are going to be infected? Pardon? Yep. Oh, the Thames is going that way. The ones below. The ones below it, the red ones. Um, and what a doctor noticed, because notice, just because the homes are beside each other doesn't mean they're getting that water. It was totally random all over London. Um, and a doctor noticed, he, having been to enough homes, he figured out that homes that were connected to a particular company were the ones that were getting cholera most often. So he started having people paint their taps according to the color of the company that provided their water. And then, then they noticed a very clear pattern that this, it was actually coming from the sewer. It was stuff in the feces. Disease spreads by spreading the virus, spreading the bacteria, whatever it is, gets into your stuff, your mucus, your feces, your urine, um, and then you go and go and touch things and, and make other people sick. Um, we say, uh, uh, you know, wash your hands. And uh, um, washing your hands is 20 seconds, which is a long count. Uh, um, so if you've ever sat and counted 20 seconds, it's probably longer than you think it is. Um, sing happy birthday uh, um, to, at a regular beat. You'll probably get roughly the right time. Um, and then you're done, and then you wipe it off. But they're also sticky. It takes that long because the viruses want you to do it. They want you to go to the washroom, wipe yourself, um, get a little bit on your fingers, and then go around and touch people. You know, go bowling with your friends. Not a very common activity anymore. Um, we still go with the house every year. Those shoes, perfectly clean. You don't have to worry about the shoes. They spray them every time. They're great. The bowling balls, where you stick your fingers in, hardly ever cleaned. They have found the most amazing things in there. Um, the back of chairs in movie theaters are ne almost never decontaminated. The highest, uh, uh, the, you find really high feces and urine levels on the back of a chair. So as you're sitting back and letting your hair touch it, uh, you know, put your coat over top of it or something. That's really quite gross. We went around, um, one of my microbi labs was, um, we had to go around with a swab because we're learning how to grow culture. So we're growing bacterial cultures. We're swabbing everything we can find and reporting like, what has the highest amount of cultures? What is really diseased? Toilet seats, clean, so clean. They're great. Handle, dirtiest thing in the room. Uh, your toothbrush, if you keep your toothbrush at home in the washroom, every time you flush the toilet, it goes like this and aerosolizes everything in there and tiny droplets of water you can't see come out and then they deposit on your toothbrush. And so you, you, we can detect feces on your toothbrush in your bathroom. So. One of the things that help reduce that, close the toilet seat when you flush. That will actually make a difference. Um, and ages ago, Mythbusters actually tried to test this. And they found they, you know, what method worked best. They had the toothbrush with a cup over it and all these different things. They couldn't do the experiment because the amount of feces just having a toilet in the room and flushing was so high, they couldn't get a control run working at all. It was there's feces everywhere all the time, even if they brought something in clean. The only thing they could figure out worked, take your toothbrush out of the room. No, it is, you know, your own family species. You've probably been okay with that up until now. Probably fine with that. Good. Don't worry about it too much. Mutations in cancer. Some cancers can be inherited. As in, you may have a mutation that increases your risk of a particular... It's like inheriting one of the lottery tickets. Um, because no one does it on their own. This is often why they ask for your family history. Uh, when you're going through a health check, uh, did you or your family have testicle cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer? What runs in your family? Those mutations may make it more risk risky for you to have other mutations. Um, a friend I know, this isn't cancer, but her grandparents got Alzheimer's when they were in their 40s on both sides of her family. 
And then she saw her parents go through the so same thing. So in university, she was planning to get Alzheimer's in her 40s. So picking jobs and things that she could raise enough money to help take care of her kids. But by the time her 40s started, she started to decline. She could do that because she knew her family history. Uh, works by altering cell division. Cancers require several mutations to transform a healthy cell into a cancerous cell. Um, I think we already did this one. Cancer causing agents are called carcinogens. like several mutations you need for it to have and I had the whole list down and I'm like it's probably not really needed for grade 10 but if you're interested uh, one of the things that cells do is that you'll notice if you're not cancer these cells aren't growing one of the reasons they're not growing is because they have neighbors and uh, um, when you have neighbors and you feel crowded you don't want to grow when you have enough neighbors, a chemical is released by the cells themselves to say, don't reproduce. There's a ton of us around, you don't need to. So one of the mutations is to get rid of that. If you don't care that you're crowded anymore, you're more likely to grow into a cancer. If you're growing as a cancer, you need a lot of food. So when you're developing, your um, cells release a, uh, a hormone chemical that causes blood vessels to grow towards it so that it gets fed. So that if you uh, um, have a mistake in that, you end up with like stunted growth in a variety of areas. Cancer cells will have a mutation that will start to release that chemical. So blood vessels will literally grow towards the cancer to feed it. So your cancer will get larger because it's getting fed by your own body. It is you, so it has all the signals it needs. If it just gets the right mutation, it can start doing that over and over and over again. And then, of course, once it gets big enough, pieces of it can float away and deposit in other areas of your body. One of the worries is it re also releases a chemical when it's big enough to suppress the growth of cancer. It's growing. It can overcome that. But it stops other cancers from growing. So now you have cancer. Someone comes in, excises it out, and takes it away, but it stops releasing that chemical. And then all those little chem uh, ones in other places in your body start to grow. And that's why they worry about things like what stage of cancer is it? Did it release a lot of those? Once we remove it, what is the likelihood that it's going to have other pieces grow? So catching cancer early is incredibly important because then maybe you can avoid this stage and it's more likely to be cured. Uh, because if they remove it, there may not be any other pieces to grow. But we constantly worry about that and have people who've had cancer, you know, they have to watch. Are they getting any more symptoms? Is there any coming back? Take those pieces out as fast as we can. Um, go through your cancer screens and your cancer checks. Um, as you get older, we are done mutations. Us, we are now doing Darwin and evolution. This is going to be our lab on Wednesday. Perfect timing. No, no. Hold up. What time? The class ends earlier today. They took away by two. Okay. 20 minutes. Fast as possible, Mr. Neufeld. Let's go. Darwin. Wallace. Natural selection. Darwin. You know his name. He's become synonymous with evolution. He had a bulldog. Not a literal bulldog, but he had other scientists. Um, what was his name? He was known as Darwin's bulldog because Darwin was a fairly soft-spoken fellow, and he would argue about evolution against the church. He famously ar ar argued against the... Uh, the Head bishop for um, England. You also know his name because he was very wealthy. He studied, uh, um, he had time on his hands. He studied things, but he didn't have to get a job. Um, and uh, he wasn't the ship's naturalist, as uh, has often been reported. The ship actually had a naturalist. He was most likely hired because the captain um, wanted to prevent his own suicide. At the time, they thought suicide ran in families and it might be genetic. And his brother had committed suicide. So he thought, maybe I should have someone on board who's educated I can talk to. And Darwin seemed to fit the bill. 
or probably as he called him then, Charles. Um, Darwin collected a lot of, if you read uh, on The Voyage of the Bagel, um, I, I recommend it. It's not a hard read in any means, and it doesn't discuss evolution. It's just a guy going around the world collecting stuff and having no idea what he's collecting. Uh, to the point, he's collecting stuff, he's labeling it, but he has no real thoughts about what he's doing. He's just sending it all back home uh, to a taxidermist who's like stuffing this, uh, the stuff for him so we can sort of mess with it and guess about home. There is a line in there where, he, where you can see the glimmers of it. He'll talk about, I see all these species around the world and they look very similar to other species around the world. I wonder if something in the environment is changing them uh, if they move from one spot to the other. And you go, ah, that's where it started. Um, Wallace, not as well known, contributed hugely. In fact, the most you'll learn about it is why, why parts of his version was incorrect. There are parts of Darwin's version that was incorrect, but he didn't have the publishing gravitas as Darwin because he wasn't, his family wasn't as wealthy. Uh, but he did a ton of the work for it. He also collected thousands of specimens, and I would argue his work was probably better. Um, he was much more careful and methodological in his work. Uh, one of the reasons why evolution lasted as a science is because with the two of them together, it really established evolution as a uh, um, supported scientific theory. One of the most famous biologists in England at the time, but... If you want to be remembered, write something, because people are going to forget what you say once you're gone. But Darwin wrote a book, and that book got published, and his family kept publishing it, and other people kept reading it, and everybody in the, who teaches science wanted, oh, we'll go back to Darwin's book. Did Wallace write a book? No. Don't remember Wallace. But I want to kind of rectify that a little bit. So we got Darwin and Wallace. These are their observations. Organisms give birth pass on traits. We now know those are genes, and the traits you're passing on from your parents are on different alleles. Every population, there is a variation in traits. Some variations affect an organism's ability to reproduce. I say reproduce because it doesn't matter how long you live. I used to use survive and then people are like, oh, it's so good for survival. If you don't have kids, survival is un unnecessary. This is also not a moral philosophy. Uh, this is not science and ethics where we're teaching like deontology and utilitarianism. This is just a thing that happens like an algorithm in nature. You are not required to produce. It is not a, a moral uh, requirement that you reproduce to be a good person. It's just that traits will be selected for. If you don't re reproduce, and if those traits affected that reproduction, then those traits will be less in the population over time. If there are certain traits that stop you from producing, producing offspring, then those traits would not find themselves very plentiful in the future. If there are traits that increase the, the offspring, then you will have more of those traits. So yes, if you are faster and more fit and you can survive for longer, that might be useful in having kids. If you're an elderly grand uh, parent who's helping his children or her children, then yeah, that might be great. But if you're an older grandparent who is taking resources away from the family, then maybe that's not a good trait. And maybe we need to invent some heliomerases that cut off the ends of the chromosomes and cause those people to go away. That's actually the reason why we think that those exist. 
is so that the elder population doesn't take resources from the new population. It's the only reason that they've managed to come up with. Some species have such a low reproductive level, those tend to be longer lived ones, um, like those turtles, because not many of them survive, so that doesn't have as big an impact. So successful variations help organisms. So you really want to insult your grandparents, just like you're hogging all the resources. Die already and give me my inheritance. Chop, chop, people. Help. Hold on. What was I going to write there? Help organisms have more children survive. Unsuccessful variations inability to reproduce or just less children. This is some, uh, I think there's a, how many of you have seen Idiocracy? A movie that came out how in the future everybody's going to be like, so stupid. Because some people have looked around and said, look, when people get an education, and, and I'm going to, you know, assume then they're quite bright, they tend to have less children. But people who don't get an education have like 20 children. Eventually, everybody's going to be not very bright. Turns out, to be a human in modern society, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, you have to be quite smart. There's no indication intelligence is going down. In fact, just the opposite. Average IQ scores have been going up every year since we've started measuring them. People are seem to be getting smarter over time. They also could be getting better at taking IQ tests. So that's a confounding factor. Um, but we are making changes in other ways, but it doesn't seem to be uh, affecting something as broad as intelligence. That's not being selected for. When you get more educated and you realize, I have money and kids are expensive, I have to send them to Brentwood, you'll probably have less kids. But if you don't have to send them to Brentwood and you need kids to help survive, like you need them to work on the farm, you're probably going to have 20 kids. Question was over there somewhere. Ariel, you put up your hand. If you need workers to Yes, that used to be a, a um, that was one of the reasons why we had very large families. Um, if you go back in your family tree, odds are your grandparents, great grandparents had many more kids than your current parents do. So myself, we have I have two spawn. My parents had four spawn, and on my mum's side, they have like I have like a total of like eighteen aunts and uncles. Like it's insane. Um, but they came from a farming family, um, emigrated out of Russia via Germany, um, Neufeld. And uh, one of the reasons is that the chance of, uh, um, uh, first of all, you're not just dying in childbirth, but also your child surviving at all. Infant mortality used to be really high. So if you wanted a guarantee of two children to survive to take care of you when you were in your old age, you needed to have on average 12 children given the infant mortality rate. So 12 children meant that you had a more comfortable, you had children to help take care of you when you were older. Now, if you had 12 children, is there a good chance you'll have six? Yes. But if you wanted like a 95% chance of having at least two, then you needed to have 12. Now, as infant mortality rates have dropped, people have started having less children. Not because they've noticed that, but because... Now when you're old, I've got 17 kids and I'm like 95, this is way too many. People have noticed this. They don't, they don't, there's no, there's not this, you know, sort of unconscious need to have lots of children to make sure that you have grandchildren, you know, to have, uh, um, to enjoy when you're older. Probably one of your kids is going to survive no matter what. If you have two kids, odds are you're probably going to have two kids later. Maybe you only have one, but infant mortality has really dropped in all countries, not just like, 
ones that have like medical systems uh, um, like Canada. Infant mortality uh, rates around the world is one of humanity's great success stories. We've managed to decrease them um, very often. But yeah, also the chance of the um, uh, dying in childbirth also used to be really high. Uh, to the point that if you watch some really old movies that are themselves are talking about older times, so, you know, 18th century, sometimes the question was not, you know, oh my goodness, your wife is dying in childbirth. It was, oh my goodness, one of them's going to die. As the doctor, who do you want me to save? Your wife or the child? And the husband got to make the decision. The mom wasn't even asked. But thankfully, that hasn't happened in at least 50 years. Since the 70s, I think, was the last case a doctor was uh, um, charged with doing such a thing. Successful organisms. Now, again, not a moral treatise. You do not have to have kids. In fact, we're suffering from overpopulation in many ways. You just just have the amount you can enjoy. Reproduce often. So bacteria, extremely su uh, successful organism. There are more bacteria on the planet than there are uh, than there will ever be human. It is suggested that if you manage, without destroying the bacteria, to vaporize the planet, you could still see it standing on the moon just by the bacteria that was left. So vaporize the planet and leave only the bacteria behind, you'd still be able to see it. There's a ton of bacteria everywhere. Um, common misconceptions. Large, healthy, straight, smart. Sure, all of those can help your reproductive success. In fact, one of the ideas behind the development of our brain is that it allowed us to gossip about who's having sex with who, which is really important for knowing your... Uh, whose parentage is what, which would help your reproductive uh, chances if you picked a partner who wasn't going to cheat on you. As well, the ability to um, think and invent tools and solve problems seems to be a useful trait amongst humans. If you can do art, paint, draw, um, sing, you are engaging large amounts of your brain. That is a sign uh, that you have a healthy functioning brain. That has been known, uh, seen to be a part of sex selection in humans, as in we tend to pick humans as partners who have these strengths. And so, would you like to come up to my partner and see uh, apartment and see some of my etchings or some of my pictures as a pickup line? Works because you are demonstrating your intellectual prowess. I have a brain, and I can use it in a way that's totally useless. Have children with me. It doesn't matter, however, any of these traits don't matter if they decrease your reproductive success. So if you are so smart that you never have children because children are annoying, then that is going to be uh, bred out. As a famous species of fish, there was two uh, phenotypes, the male and the female. The males were large, aggressive, and established herds of female fish that they would then uh, um, uh, mate with and all the eggs were related to the male. Until um, some scientists who were looking more closely noticed that there were some males that looked almost identical to females and were hidden amongst these populations. And they're like, what's going on here? Well, it turns out when a large male would be aggressively approached by another large male, they would go off and fight. And while they were fighting, these little tiny males that looked a lot like the females would race in and have sex with all of the fish while they were gone. So the eggs were actually related to them. So being smaller and faster turned out to be just as good 
as large and slow. Question? Okay, um, oop. last thought on the bottom. And this is the fundamental al algorithm passing on successful alleles, traits, increases those alleles in the next generation. Question? You seem to be arguing about something. Sorry? What side do you think? What's ben, it's okay. Sorry? This facial hair? Both sides. I, I don't think facial hair is a, as a, um, unlike baldness, I don't think it's a, um, a, a sexual characteristic like that's only on the X chromosome. However, that being said, it's also controlled by testosterone levels. So like, Anybody can grow a beard, provided they have enough testosterone. But naturally, uh, um, if you are uh, genetically and morphologically, well, not even genetically, if you are hormone-wise um, female, often you will have lower testosterone levels when you grow facial hair. But a lot of females will grow some facial hair. Everybody has testosterone, whether you're male or female, in terms of your genetics and production. Yeah. Which one? Passing on successful alleles slash traits increases those alleles in the next generation. Do you have any questions? No. Yeah. And this is the entirely all that evolution is. There's a lot of detail and a lot of ways in how it works. And there's um, sexual uh, um, uh, choices in there. If there's ever a trait that actually indicates your health, I suggested the brain in humans. But the bullfrog's uh, croak is another one. Um, when a bullfrog croaks and it says things really, really loud, you have to be a very healthy bullfrog to do that. That was noticed at some point by female bullfrogs. And they said, I want to mate with the uh, frog that has the loudest croak. And that turned out to be an excellent indicator for uh, health. And so now they have extremely loud croaks. Ahem, people, focus. Notes back out. What are you doing? We have two more minutes, and I said we are blasting through notes. We do not have time to wait for people to take stuff back out. Go, 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 go. Today is a blast of notes day. Number one. Nature selects by one. Allowing them to live and reproduce to choosing who dies and doesn't reproduce, uh, although technically everybody dies. And by nature choosing, it's just nature's just the environment. So if, you do, if, if an organism dies and doesn't leave uh, behind any offspring, those traits are just gone. It works like a sculpture. You carve a sculpture discarding pieces. Most species that have ever evolved are now extinct. Most things are dead. All species are dead. We are the lucky fraction of a percent that has managed to survive uh, throughout the eons. So you had very, very successful ancestors because most species aren't here right now. And we are currently sitting in one of the greatest mass extinctions in all of geological history. Uh, species are disappearing at a rate higher than has ever happened before. Even when the meteor struck the Earth, we think that we are killing off species even faster. 
they have to adapt to live in human environments or we just clear their environment for more farmland. So. Wait, no, no, Bill hasn't gone. What are you doing? Go, 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 go. I don't care. And if I have to argue about it, I'll keep you an extra 30 seconds so we can finish it up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's good. So keep your don't tell the bell goes thing out. What? They changed the bell. Are you saying that Brentwood's incompetent? And so done that? Fine. It's 26 now. I won't argue about it anymore.